All right, we're in James chapter 5. And we're going to finish up James today. Don't know where we're going to go from here. Start in verse 12, go all the way to verse 20. Of course, we want to review last week real quick. Last week we talked a lot about uh, being patient through suffering, uh, persecution. We read some stories. People who were persecuted. Anybody remember any of those stories that we read? About people who have been persecuted in the past? Remember about Bartholomew? What happened to Bartholomew? Anyone want to tell me? Well, he was, uh, he was beaten, and he was skinned alive, and he was nailed to a cross upside put down, and he kept preaching to people as they walked by, I remember, and then they yeah. finally, to get him shut off, what did they do, Sarah? They uh, struck him with a spear. No, that's they not it. They cut his head off, that's right. They get him to be quiet, because they didn't want him to preach anymore, that was the whole point of it in the first place, they didn't like his message. So through all that, he kept on preaching. Praise the Lord. And um, it talks about being patient until the coming of the Lord. We receive the fruit of our labor, just like the farmer receives the fruit of his labor as he waits for the early and latter rain. But we need to establish our hearts, be firmly planted in the word of God, upon the rock, not upon sinking sand, and upon obedience and trust and obey. Otherwise, there may come a time where persecution comes, and because our hearts are not established, not firmly embedded into the rock of God's word, that we'll just fall away. We'll follow us. We need to establish our hearts. And we, it gave us examples of the prophets who, uh, had su- who suffered and were patient through the suffering, endured suffering, talking about Job. And uh, so with these examples, as an example to us, we should continue in the faith. And the word patience means long-suffering. So we suffer long. And it says, of course, not grumbling in the process. So patient doesn't mean you sit around and twiddle your thumbs and complain about waiting around. Patience means you endure long-suffering, and you do it with a Christ-like spirit, which means you're not grumbling and complaining about it. But you receive whatever the Lord will bring your way, just like Job received it. Now, Job, Job didn't grumble, but what he did do was he knew he, he was blameless before God, and he knew that what his friends were saying that he deserved it because he was in sin, was wrong. That he didn't deserve it. And uh, in the end, as it says here, remember that the Lord was very compassionate and merciful to Job in the end. Because what happened to Job in the end? He gave him twice as much as he had in the beginning. So even through it all, uh, we may not get the same results Job does on earth as we persevere. But in heaven, we'll have better results than we ever could imagine here on earth. All right, now we're going to start in verse 12. Now, uh, if you look in your Bible, it may have verse 12 as part of the verse 11 section, but I, I think verse 12 basically starts a new thought. And it kind of just, it's a little bit out of nowhere, I guess you could say, what, what he says here in verse 12. It just, it doesn't even really fit in with the context, I don't think. Um, but he obviously reminds it for a reason. Well, let's just read from verse 12 to verse 20, and then we'll kind of just go back through it. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into temptation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let, him pray, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death, and cover a multitude of sins. All right, verse 12. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Let's turn to Matthew 5 to see what Jesus said about this. Something very... And you'll see, as we've seen all throughout the book of James, that James 
is almost like preaching the Sermon on the Mount all over again. Throughout this whole book. We've gone to the Beatitudes quite a bit, and now we go on to Matthew 5, verse 33. That's what the Lord Jesus says about this. Again, you have heard it that it was said to those of old, you should not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no be no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Here in society, and in Jewish culture back then, where James was living, where Jesus was living, uh, they took this swearing thing very lightly. Now, when I say swearing, I don't mean four-letter cuss words. I don't mean bad words coming out of your mouth. Although it is bad to do this. I mean, like, I, I promise I'll do this. Or I swear I'll do this. And we have, have we seen, gone through James, we see that your tongue and your mouth and what you say are powerful things. And you need to watch what you say and keep a tight ring on your tongue. And uh, bitter and fresh water should not come out of your tongue. And uh, you know, bitter and sweet and salty and fresh should not come out of the same mouth. Because that's hypocrisy. Uh, but when, when you say to someone, um, I promise I'll do this, or I promise I'll do that, what you're telling them is this. You're telling them that just saying yes, I'll do this, or just saying no, I won't do this, isn't enough. And what you're saying is, by adding I promise to it, or I swear by Jerusalem I'll do this, or I swear by my father's grave, you hear people say, that I'll do this. That you just saying, without saying that, is nothing. And if your word, if what you say means nothing, then no one can ever trust anything you say unless you put I promise on the front of it, or I swear on the front of it. But if someone can't trust anything you say unless you put promise or swear on it, then they never really know who you really are. You can say whatever you want, and someone can't, someone's going to be thinking, well, I don't know if I can really trust this or not, unless he says, I promise. But even then, people have told me all throughout my life, 31 years now, I promise this, but then they don't do it. So it's still just worthless words. So what Jesus is saying, what his half-brother James is saying here, is let your yes be yes and your no be no. There's no reason to add anything onto it, because your yes and your no should be trustworthy. People should be able to trust you when you say you'll do something. Whether you're saying it to your brother, or your sister, or your mom, or your dad, or your spouse, your wife, or your friend. They should be able to trust what you say you're going to do. If you say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to be here at this time, I'm going to be here at this time, they, sh they should be able to trust you're going to be there that time. If you say, well, well Dad, I'm going to take out the trash, you should be able to trust you're going to do it. And, and, then, and that's why you should always, you should never be flippantly saying, well, I'll, I'll do this. Never just say, as a kind of past thinking, yeah, I'll do that. And then just forget about it the next second. If you say you're going to do something, you should remember that you're going to do it. Otherwise, don't say you're going to do it. What I can do, because I have a problem uh, being on time place at a time, I, I don't give someone an exact time I'll be there. I say, well, I'll be there around this time. Because I know, I, I know my past, first of all, and I know I have four small children and a wife to get ready to go places, so I say, yeah, I'll be there around this time. And I don't give them an the exact time, because I know if I do, I'll probably end up being proving myself a liar. And I don't want them to think they can't trust what I'm going to say. So if you're going to say something... You need to remember what you said and you need to do it. Otherwise, your mind is just, if you're, what you're saying is worthless. And it doesn't matter if you add I promise onto it or I swear onto it, uh, you need to do it. So saying I promise or I swear is, is basically saying, according to James and to, and to Jesus, that your regular yes and no mean nothing. That's what you're telling the people when you say that. But your yes and no should mean something. Because what you say should mean something. Otherwise, you're a liar. And the Bible says all liars should have their part in the lake of fire. Okay, so let's go back to James here. You can see how James... James is a little bit different than Paul. We've seen this all throughout the letter. Paul gives long, drawn-out arguments that just go together. You can't just take a couple verses out of Paul and say, this is what it says. You have to look at the whole like three or four chapter context, even the whole book context, or even in light of other books context. Where James, he just gave him little proverbs here and there. And that's why, it's the same thing at the end of 1 John. At the end of 1 John, uh, I think it's the last verse he says here. 1 John 5.21, John says, Little children, keep yourself from idols. Amen. Well, where did that come from? It's like starting a whole new thought all over again. So, so th these guys are, are a little bit different than Paul. Paul was a uh, very educated man. 
And uh, so he, he gave long, drawn-out arguments and because of who he was dealing with, the Jew and Gentile situation. But anyway, if you don't let your yes be yes, you know or no, what does James say? You will fall into judgment. You will fall into judgment. And you might have a, a footnote there on the judgment. It's a hypocrisy there. But what happens here, into judgment, is hypocrisis. Hippo is into, crisis is judgment. Put those two together, what is it combined? Hypocrisis. So some manuscripts have those two words combined, and it's the word hypocrite. Now, when I say the word hypocrisis, and I say it's the word hypocrite, what have I just done from the Greek to the English? I transliterated it. Now, if I'm going to translate, I'm going to tell you what the word hip hypocrisy means. Okay? It means you're, you're not genuine, you're fake. But hypocrisis, and I bring it to, to the English, and I say it's hypocrite, I've just transliterated I've brought the word into English and just made the letters what it would have been uh, from Greek to English. But if I were to, to uh, translate it, it would mean fall into judgment. Because what happens to hypocrites? They go into judgment. So you don't want to be a hypocrite. Okay, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. If any, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Romans 12, 15 says... Weep with those who are weeping. Rejoice with those who are rejoicing. It's okay to weep if you're suffering. There's a whole book called Lamentations. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. It's okay to weep before God. It's okay to be broken before God. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. So if you have trouble in your life, problems in your life, it's okay to weep. It's okay to cry over those things. In fact, he says right here, is anyone suffering? Let him pray. And so you shouldn't just weep just to weep. You should come before God in prayer. And if anyone among us, as Romans 12, 15 says, is weeping, we should weep with them. That's why when funerals come, the preachers tend to go one or two different directions. I kind of want to be in the middle. One, one wants to just, just comfort them, comfort them, and weep with them, weep with them, and not give them the word of God about eternity. The other one wants to be so brash and give them the word of God, bam, bam, bam. But it's kind of in the middle. If someone's weeping over a death of a lost one, a loved one. They've lost a loved one. You need to weep with them. You need to comfort them and pray that God will comfort them. But at the same time, you need to share the truth with them that, listen, this person was a Christian, they're, they're in a better place. This person's not a Christian. Well, don't follow them into eternity. You know, so there's, there's a, someone's weeping, you should weep with them. Not laugh at them. Ah, look at their weeping. No, you should weep with them. It shouldn't be too hard. You should weep with them in their brokenness. And then, you can, of course, you can share the truth with them. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Of course, why is the person cheerful? Because every good and perfect it comes out from the Father of heavenly lights. So when God blesses us, we should be thankful for it. We should be cheerful for it. And we should remember that. that and, and be cheerful at all times because of those things. So we have in Acts 16.25 the example of uh, Paul and Silas. Who had just been arrested. And what happened was Paul had rebuked the spirit out of a girl. And the spirit came out of the girl. And people didn't like that, people of the town. So they threw him in prison. It says in verse 25, but at midnight, midnight's pretty late, most people are sleeping by then, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. So they're praying and singing hymns. So yet they're, they're probably sorrowful for being in jail. I don't want to be in that situation. Who, who does? But yet they're still rejoicing. Because God has count them worthy to suffer for His name. And because it could be worse. It could be worse for them. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let, him, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The elders here is presbyteros, and it's where we get the word, word Presbyterian from, Presbyterian church. So if, if Presbyterian Church is, is actually translated, it would be Elder Church. That's what it would be translated as. Okay? Let's, look at, let's go to 1 Timothy 3, so you can see what the qualifications are for an elder in the church. Now what we're going to look at right now is probably translated into bishop in your Bible. Uh, and it's not the same word as we just looked at in James. It's episkopos, which is where the Episcopal Church comes from. 
So if they, if they translated their word, it would be bishop church. So we have elder church and bishop church. But they mean the same thing. They're synonyms. Synonyms is two words that mean the same thing. Antonyms are two words that are, are opposite. I mean the opposite. So this is synonyms here. Bishop and elder. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, this is verse 1 of 1 Timothy 3, he desires a good work. And then he gives the qualification. The bishop then must be blameless. No reason for blame. The husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, not gentle, oh, but, but gentle, not quarrelsome, but uh, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. If a man does not know how to rule his ha own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice or immature or a new believer, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testament among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So you have all these qualifications for an elder or an overseer or a bishop, all the same person. So there's this some pretty stri uh, strict qualifications here. And what I've seen from church to church is people don't follow these qualifications. They say, well, this person has a business. They know how to make money. They can help us run the church. Uh, this person is liked by a lot of people. Well, are they blameless? Do they have a good reputation among the people who are living in the same area as them? Um, do they have control over their children? That's a real big thing these days. Most men don't have that. Most men have a problem with that. Not greedy for money? Ooh, Bishop T.D. Jakes doesn't qualify for that. Uh, not covetous? Yeah, he doesn't qualify for that either. Uh, so, and not being a novice. So if someone's a new Christian, should they be made a bishop or an overseer or an elder? No, because what would happen most times, it might be puffed up. Puffed up. So it needs, these would be, a, I mean, I understand that some people, they first, they first become a Christian, they're real zealous, they're hungry for the Word of God. And what I see on these networks like TBN, they'll get someone who's a, a music star who gets saved, like a MC Hammer, or they'll get a, a movie star like Mr. T gets saved. And they'll get him on TV right away and put him out in front of everybody to teach people. He just got saved. Is he able to teach somebody? But they do this because he already has a platform. And they want to get people to watch their show. Look, look, Mr. T got saved. Look, MC Hammer got saved. Well, that's great. But let them learn. Let them be discipled. Uh, and when they're able to teach, able to teach, because should everyone be teachers? Why? Stricter judgment, James says. Not everyone should be teachers because they've got stricter judgment. Okay, so let's go back to James. That's the qualifications for an elder here. And now with that in mind, that's why he's saying, let him call for the elders of the church, let him pray over them. Let them pray over him. Okay? Uh, now this anointing with oil thing. I thought about this quite a bit throughout my life. I've seen people, when they pray for someone, they'll have them come up to the front of their church, they'll have this little, uh, little veil of... Uh, of oil, and they'll dip it on their fingers and do a little cross symbol on their forehead, and they think there's, I don't know, maybe there's some kind of magical powers behind that. But there's no magical powers behind oil. God hasn't, like, it's not some kind of spell you cast, like in the movie Harry Potter. It's like, you say some words and God's going to heal them. No, oil in Jewish culture and everywhere has natural healing properties. Natural healing properties. And uh, if, if, if you're against uh, regular medicine, like I think most of us are, you look for natural remedies because they'll heal you naturally. And I think God's provided a remedy for almost everything in nature because uh, that's the way he's done it. And he wants us to, to go to him and not to man-made chemicals and stuff like that to try to heal ourselves. So I think what this verse is saying in, in James 5.14 is that we should pray that God will heal us. But at the same time, we should do everything we can to heal ourselves. We shouldn't sit aside and, and be eating all the junk food in the world and say, God, heal me. God, heal me. Is that the way it works? And we shouldn't be uh, doing whatever it is that causes our sickness and expect God to heal us while we're still causing our sickness. And people think there's some kind of magical formula here. But no, it's not the way it works. Oil is natural healing properties. So we should, we should go in the process of healing ourselves and at the same time ask the Lord to heal us. 
And because that way we're kind of covering all the bases, I guess you can say. We're, tr we're, we're doing everything we can. It's in our power. But sometimes there's nothing we can do to heal ourselves. Sometimes we can't do anything. Uh, my wife's been sick quite a bit lately, and, and we've gone to the doctor and gotten medicine. We're doing everything we can, and we're also praying for her. Now, if all we did was just pray for her and didn't take to the doctor, I don't think we'd be doing all we could to get her here, unless, unless God specifically told me not to go to the doctor. But God hasn't told me that. Okay? Or, or if we just went to the doctor and didn't pray, we wouldn't be doing all we should be doing. So when you do both, then you're doing everything you can be doing. And then you know God's will will be done in the end. Because is it God's will always to heal somebody? It sure isn't. God has the power of life and death. And I'll tell you this, there's sometimes where God doesn't want to heal someone, whether they're Christian or not, because through this suffering, through this pain, they're drawing closer to, them, closer to Him. They're depending upon Him more. They're praying more, like they should have been in the first place. So God draws them near. It says, The prayer of faith will save the sick, and if he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. So the prayer of faith will heal, will save the sick. Not save them, I don't think, in a salvation sense. Let's turn to Mark, uh, Mark chapter 2, and we'll read one story that I think correlates with the, what, what James said here very, very good. Mark chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 1. Mark 2, 1 says this, And again, he, Jesus, entered Capernaum after some days, and was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And they could not come near him because of the crowd. They uncovered the roof where he was, so when he had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were reasoning, they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed, and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. So, what's the first thing Jesus did with this paralytic? Did he heal him physically? Or did he forgive him of his sins? Now, I propose to you this. Now, I can't find an explicit verse in the Bible that says this, but this is my theory. I don't think that someone who prays to God for healing, that God will heal them unless first they are forgiven of their sins, unless they first come to repentance. Okay, because uh, God has no reason to heal that person, because I think one of the reasons he gives them a sickness is to bring them to repentance. So... Uh, I think this is a story that kind of uh, backs that up. But he says, your, your, your sins are forgiven of you. And, uh, and that's why it must, it says right here, it says, the prayer of faith will save the sick. Now, if someone is a sinner, they haven't trusted in God, can they pray a prayer of faith? No, they can't. Now, all people can pray a prayer of faith over them, but can they pray a prayer of faith? No, they cannot. Uh, yeah, God, we, we'll get to that in a minute about prayers again. We talked about the four different answers of prayer. But God only heals the, hears the prayers of the repentant. Whether someone who's been, who repented a long time ago or someone who's repenting right then, he only hears those prayers. And if he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. So, And this seems to even be saying that maybe one of the reasons they have a sickness is because they have sinned in their life. That doesn't mean that every single person who has a sickness is because of their sin in their life doesn't mean that. Uh, we saw that uh, one time when, when Jesus was uh, talking about the man who was blind from birth. The disciples said, well, why is he blind? Because of his sin or his parents' sin? Well, neither. For the glory of God. So, but there are, there, are, there are examples when people were disciplined by God 
for their sins. In fact, let's go to one right now. I believe it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to stop the top of my head here, so let's try and remember. Maybe it's 2 Corinthians 3. Okay, it's actually 1 Corinthians 11. Actually, that's not it either. <laughs> um, well, I can't find it, but... It's, it's a scripture that where Paul talks about how some have fallen asleep early because of their conduct at the Lord's Supper and how they are eating and drinking judgment upon themselves. And of course, falling asleep early simply means they've, they've died sooner than they would have died. Um, so I can't find it off the top of my head, unfortunately. I should have looked it up beforehand. I didn't think about it, though. Okay, so yeah. But the point is that, that God will discipline you. He will chastise you if, if you're in sin, whether you're, you're professed to be a believer or not. And, um, and to the point where he might even kill you. And uh, some people will use that scripture that I'm talking about to try to say that, uh, that God's only punishment for sin for a believer is that he'll kill them. But what kind of punishment is that for a believer if they die and go to heaven? That's not a punishment at all. Uh, what's that, John? Promotion, yeah. Promotion, that's right. Yeah, so I, I can't find the verse off the top of my head, but anyway, that, that's, that's the whole concept there, that yeah, if, if you're living in sin, the God can and sometimes will punish you physically. So you need to be, you know, in fact, when I get sick or I have a problem, the first thing I think is, you know, I examine myself. Is there something I've done wrong? Yep, got the verse there, John? No, that's not it. That's, that's, that's just talking to people who have uh, not been resurrected yet. But yeah, that, that's falling asleep means they're dead. Yeah. I could probably find it if I look up my concordance real quick here. Uh, no, it's not picking it up. Okay, anyway, so yeah, that's the concept there that, that uh, God can and will punish you physically. Okay, so, so my... my Theory here of God will not heal an unrepentant person because they have to pray a prayer of faith. And God, I believe, an unrepentant person's life has a reason for their sickness or their problems or their trouble. In fact, many times in my life, for my loved ones, I've prayed that God will give them an idea of the frailty of life, that He'll allow maybe bad things to happen to them to wake them up so they'll come to a knowledge of the truth. And there's nothing wrong with praying that kind of prayer. Right, let's go to verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another, or, or your sins. Confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective and fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, the Catholic Church will try to use this scripture as something to back up confession. You know, Catholics, they have this little booth, and on one side the priest goes in, the other side the person goes in, there's like a little, you know, kind of cloth cover that goes through, you kind of open it up and you go in, and, and then there's this box. You open the box and you're kind of speaking through the screen to the priest. And you're confessing your sins to the priest and the priest gives you some kind of penance. Go do this, that, and this, and that, and, and God will forgive you. Is that what this is talking about here? It's not, it's not saying confess your sin to someone that you could be forgiven. It's not what it's saying here. Who do you confess your sins to if you want to be forgiven? Yeah, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's not Catholic confession. It's not promoting penance here. What penance simply says, go do this, that, this, and that, and then you'll be forgiven. That's work salvation. That is work salvation. Okay? But let me just talk about confession here for a second. And this is a biblical thing, to confess your sins one to another. And let's look at some reasons why I believe people don't confess their sins. 
One is pride. Especially in our circles, where we believe, you know, perfection is possible. We never have to sin. We don't have a sinful nature. We're not born with an original sin. Pride gets in the way. They think, well, man, people think really highly of me. What are they going to think of me if I confess my sins to them? And pride gets in the way. But pride shouldn't get in the way. And, 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 if, and it says right here, confessing your sins will do what to you? Heal you. Spiritually. Not, it's not talking about physical healing here, but spiritual healing here. So pride gets in the way sometimes. And then there's just thinking of, I'm the only one who's sinned this sin before. I'm the only one. So pride gets in the way, and this idea that I'm the only one, and people will look at him and like, man, why is he having, why did he sin that sin? So they have this idea of I'm the only one. Well, that's usually a lie. Um, and then the third option here is that they're thinking people will judge me. But the Bible says that you restore the brother what? Gently. Okay? So these are three things that get in the way of people confessing their sins to their brothers. It doesn't mean you go before the whole church and confess every single sin they've ever done. Uh, but it does mean that, which is, and it definitely doesn't mean that if you sin, you should confess every single little detail of it. Because in doing so, you may cause someone else to sin in the process. By confessing every little, you might tempt them to do the same thing you've done. They may think, wow, that sounds like pretty cool. I want to do that too. But you, don't, you just confess that you've sinned. And sometimes you may be specific and say what kind of sin it is. Uh, but the whole point of this is that they may pray for you. See, what you're doing when you hold this and you give in to pride, I'm the only one thinking, or they're going to judge me and look down on me, that kind of thinking, what you're, what you're, what you're doing here is you're, you're taking back spiritual power that God's given and made available to you through other saints who can pray for you. And uh, as you confess your sins to them, what should happen is there shouldn't be, well, good, let's get the pride out of the way. Maybe it will humble you a little bit. Some people need more humility. They need to see themselves as they really are. Not as they put up a face to show everybody they, that they, they really aren't. Okay? They'll probably find out some brother will say, you know what, brother? I've seen that before. I've done that before. And, and, and now you're like, wow, I, I can relate to someone. Maybe, maybe since I've gotten out of it, he can, he can help me get out of it as well. Yes? That's another form of confession. Yeah. By relating to someone and say, I've done that before and this is how I overcame that in Christ Jesus. Amen. Because if, if, if you want to know how to kill a chicken, you go to someone who's done it before. And then they show you and they say, wow, I can do it myself next time. And if, and if, you're, if you have a certain sin in your life that it, it keeps going back and tempting and maybe you fall through it once in a while, th this is something you go to someone who's been through there and done that and they can help you get out of it. And then this judge me thing. Hopefully if the brothers respond properly... They won't judge them. I'm not saying judge them in a sense where they don't tell them it's wrong. Of course they're going to tell them it's wrong. They know it's wrong. That's why they're confessing it. But they'll find out that these people will forgive them and will help them. And what they'll see there is a picture of God. Sometimes we... I, I, I've done this to myself before. Well, I'm probably harder on myself when it comes to sin I've had in the past than God actually is on me. Where I, I have a hard time forgiving myself. I'll, I'll say, well, man, I can't believe I did that, and it was like a year ago. Well, God's forgiven me of it. I need to move on, get over it, and just don't do it again. I press on toward the goal. So I, I'll find out, hopefully, that they won't do that to me, and they'll be gentle to me and loving and forgiving towards me and, and, want, to and want to uh, help me. And then from there, I get a picture of what God's like. When a believer acts Christ-like towards me after I've confessed my sins to them, I get to see a picture of God. Because sometimes we, we have our own picture of God. And, and we think God's up in heaven with a sledgehammer just ready to slam us on the head every time we sin. Now God is just like the prodigal son. He wants us to come back. Now, if we die on our sins, he lets, of course, the sledgehammer is coming then. But the, the fact of the matter is that, that God wants us to be, us to be forgiven. He wants, to be rec wants us to be reconciled to Him. And when we see in person someone doing that to us, it, it keeps in mind what God is really like. Sometimes, if, if we, because we can't see God, and sometimes we, we just get a wrong picture of Him. When we see a, a Christ like believer treating us as God would treat us, then we get a greater picture of what God is like. So when you do confess, you have humility, you have fellowship. I'm not the only one. 
You get a good picture of God, and the most important thing, which we're talking about here, is you get more strength. Because there's power and numbers when it comes to praying. Calling on the name of the Lord. Yeah, so it's always... Uh, we talked about this before, let's remind you real quick. There's always four different answers to prayer. Okay? One is yes. One is no. One is wait. And what? One is, I can't hear you. Can't hear you. That's the sinner. Okay, so those are the four answers to prayer. If you come to God in, in, in repentance, in, in, in faith, believing Him, not doubting, but believing, uh, you won't get this answer right here. You'll never get this answer, I can't hear. But you may get yes, you may get no, you may get wait. And it says at the end of verse 16, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Well, let's just turn to a righteous man in Numbers chapter 11. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Fourth book of the Bible. Numbers chapter 11. And look at the prayer of one righteous man. Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. Now when the people complained, or grumbled, what about it last week, it displeased the Lord. For the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them, and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses. And, Mo- and when Moses prayed to the Lord, what happened? The fire was quenched. So, the effective prayer of who? A righteous man avails much. Does he, is it the prayer of a sinner avail much? It avails nothing. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Unless you're going to repent. Can't hear you. So they went to Moses and he prayed. And what happened? The Lord answered. Because he's a righteous man. And his effective prayer avails much. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 13. Or chapter 12. Verse 13. And this is after Miriam and Moses had spoken badly uh, Miriam and Aaron had spoken badly about Moses. And God didn't like this. Because Moses was the, called the friend of God. He said, some people hear me, but I speak to Moses face to face. That's what God said. That's not, little, not literally face to face, but he speaks to him as a friend. So his anger was aroused towards Miriam and towards Aaron, and Miriam became a leper. She became leprous. Her skin had a skin disease called leprosy that eats away at your flesh. And you can eventually die from it. So in verse 11 of number 12, it says, So Aaron said to Moses, O my Lord, talking to Moses, not Lord, capital L, Lord, lowercase l, please do not say, lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one, as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So my, Moses cried out to the Lord, Please heal her, O God, I pray. So Moses is still a righteous man. He's still praying. They went to him and asked him to pray to God. What happened? Then the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days, and afterwards she may be received again. So, is God always going to do what Moses is praying to do? Well, he may say no. Or he may say, wait seven days. That's what God does sometimes. So, you're not guaranteed. If you go to a righteous man and he prays for you, you're not guaranteed to have your prayer answered. You're not guaranteed to get a yes every single time. It's not some formula here. Anoint with oil, righteous men pray, it's going to happen. No. God's will will be done. And who has known the mind of the Lord? The Holy Spirit has. We seek after the mind of the Lord, and He may reveal it to us, but we don't always know it. So the effective, fervent prayer of righteous men availed much. They go to a different righteous man here, whose prayer availed much as well. Verse 17, Elijah. <clears throat> was a man with a nature like ours. Let's stop there. A nature like ours. Is that talking about a sinful nature? Does God answer the prayer of a sinner? So is he talking about Elijah having a sinful nature here? Could Elijah, with a sinful nature, living in sin every day, pray to God to stop the rain for so many years and God will do it? No. Not the way it works. So he's talking about nature here. He's talking about the fact that he's a human. See, some people, when they see people like, like Elijah in the Bible, they put on the pedestal, man, Elijah's a great man of God. He prayed the rain would stop, and it stopped. And he prayed that it would start again, and it started. And he lit Elijah up to be like more than human. 
Um, he's just a human. He's just a man like you and me. John could pray that prayer and God would answer it if he wanted to. Tracy, me, he, one of the children could pray that prayer and God would answer it if he chose to. Hey, all he's simply saying here is just a man like us. Uh, Acts 14. This is, the other, this is not the same word as we see in other passages where it uses the word nature. That word is fusus, but this word is something else. And here's the other, only other use of it in the Bible. Acts 14, <clears throat> verse 15. Uh, after uh, Paul and Barnabas have done many amazing things, the people bowed down and worshipped Paul and Barnabas. Now watch the response. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God, who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them. So it, he's saying, listen, we're not gods. We don't have the nature, divine nature. We're not even angelic. We are simply human beings like you. And he's not saying here, we have a sinful nature just like you, because these people were wicked people. They were idolatrous. They were still in their sins. They hadn't trusted in Christ or repented of their sins. And they saying they're the same as them as far as the sinful nature is concerned? Of course not. He's simply saying, I'm human. I don't, no human deserves to be worshipped. No human deserves to be worshipped. And of course, Jesus was completely divine. So we're not including Jesus. When I say no human deserves to be worshipped, I'm not talking about Jesus. Jesus was completely God and completely human in the flesh. Okay? So Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours. So if Elijah can pray this prayer, so can we. If God answered Elijah, guess what? God can answer us as well. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain in the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. You know, Jesus said if you have a, a faith the size of a what? A mustard seed, you can do what? Move mountains. Now, that could be literal, maybe it's not literal, but the fact of the matter is you can do mighty things when you have faith the size of a mustard seed. Let's go to James 5.19, some important scripture here. We're really going to break this down. Let me just read it first, and I'll break it down. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turned a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Okay, so, number one, he's, he's talking to who? Brethren. Brethren, brothers. And he says, anyone among you, among who? Among the brethren. So these people we're talking about are brethren. And what have they done? They've wandered. So someone who was among the brethren wandered from the truth. Wandered from the truth. So if someone wanders from something, weren't they once a part of it? So he's talking to the brethren. Someone wanders from among the brethren. And someone turns them back. You know what that means? That's repent. The word repent means turn back. You're going this way, I'm going this way now. So he was walking amongst the brethren. He turned around and went the other way. So uh, he, rep he repented. And anyone turns him back. So he turns them back to repentance. So someone from among the brethren wanders... And someone, someone from among the brethren turns him back. That's repentance. Okay? Let him know. Let the person who turned the sinner back. Someone who turned the person, the person wandered away, and this person turned him back to be among the brethren again. Let him know this. A sinner. So now he's a sinner. So in the midst of his sin, is he still part of the brethren? No, he's a sinner. That's what the Bible says right there. So he's a sinner... Now, if you, if you turn, if one of the brethren, who takes one of the brethren who wandered away, and turns him back to be a part of the brethren, he turns a sinner now, back to the brethren, he saves him from the error of his way, and will save a soul, save a soul from death, and cover a multitude of sins. No Calvinist can refute this, these two scriptures. Never seen it done, never will. They may play with it and play games with it, but this is a fact of the matter. Someone from among the brethren wanders. Someone from among the brethren goes to that person who wandered and turns him back to the truth. And while he's not in the truth, he's not among the brethren, while he's wandering, what is he called? A sinner. He's not part of the brethren while he's wandering from the truth. He's called a sinner. 
And what happens when you turn him back? You've turned a sinner from the error of his way and will save a soul, save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And guess what? Contrary to monergism, and monergism once again says this, says God does everything. Now, tell me how many people are involved in the situation we talk about right here. We have at least three. Yeah, okay, at least three, you're right. So we have the brethren that wandered, the brethren that turns them back, and of course, who else is involved in this? God. So, modernism teaches God does everything. This scripture, and all of scripture teaches that at least three people are involved in everything. Whether it be... Uh, a preacher, a sinner, and the Holy Spirit, God, an angel, and a, and a sinner, always more than one person involved here. Okay? Now, there may be isolated instances where God does it all to speak to the person himself. He doesn't use a preacher to speak to the person. But that person still must respond properly. God doesn't make them respond. So that's James 5, 19 through 20. All right. That's the end of James. We made it through. I think we took about 11 or 12 sermons to do it. Does anyone have any questions about this section? Oh, you did? It's 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 24. Yeah, see, I was there. I just didn't look at it close enough. Right, right, you're right. So I read 23 through 26, and so that's not it. Yeah, verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup, the Lord, in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. Let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, because they're not, they're not judging themselves first, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. It's talking about death here. So weak, sick, death. God will do that if people eat and drink the body and blood of the Lord in an unworthy manner. But if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. So the point, the fact of the matter is you can be, if you're part of the, the church, you can be condemned with the world. That's why he chases you so you won't be condemned with the world. But if we judge ourselves, guess what? We don't have to be judged by God. We examine ourselves first. Thanks, thanks, Tracy. Appreciate that. Uh, the question I have is about the soil and praying for the sick. Sure. And uh, is, is it also possible that the person that's uh, anointing with the oil, not that the oil has some special magical power, but that we are trusting the Lord in His in His the way He's laid this out? person that's being anointed with oil, yes, the oil has natural healing properties, but there is the possibility or even probability of a supernatural event that God's going to move on this person when I, by faith, is, or you, by faith, as an elder of, of an assembly, anoint somebody with oil, and the person is being anointed by faith in Christ and, and God's power, receive that uh, anointing as the, this method that God's laid out, mm -hmm. that God could and uh, heal that person supernaturally. Well, yeah, God can heal anyone supernaturally whether you anoint them or not. I think that's the question here is, is this a formula that God's laying out? I'd say no, because there's other examples in Scripture where they do not anoint with oil and they do get healed. So, and, and nowhere in Scripture is this a laid out where you must anoint someone with oil and then before you pray for them. Um, so I don't think it's needed. I think he's simply saying here, once again, that, that it's, you, you're doing both things. And... Uh, I, I didn't have time to write this out, but I slated it quite a bit about how in Jewish culture, uh, if they had some kind of sickness or some kind of cut, they would put oil on it and it would heal them. Uh, so oil has natural healing properties, and it would be like someone uh, in our day and age, if they want to try to heal cancer, they eat, eat some shark oil or something like that, or just some other natural remedy that they have out there that's been proven to work. And um, so I, 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 don't, I don't think it's, I don't think, even think it's a formula. I don't even think it's, like my, my, my father-in-law would disagree with me. I think, because he, he, he's always, I remember him just being in his church, he'd always had that little flask of oil already, and he'd 
anoint someone on their head. And, and he, I think he comes from the position that this is something that God commands you to do every time, but I don't think that's true. I think this is the only time in the Bible it says this. And uh, therefore, I don't think this is giving some kind of formula here uh, of, of how we should pray for someone who is sick. I'm just simply saying that uh, if people who are sick should do everything they can to, he- to heal themselves and at the same time trust that God will do it. And it's like, um, I can't remember what guy said this, but I live my life as if I have to save myself. But I know that God's the one saving me. So I do everything I can to make up for my horrible past. But I know my making up for it doesn't really make up for it. So I'm, I'm just living for the Lord with all my heart. So when it comes to healing, I should do everything I can to heal myself. Um, you know, if someone has diabetes, guess what? They should stop eating sugar. They should eat healthy. And if they're not willing to do that, they shouldn't be praying to God to heal them. That just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I just wanted to amplify on the oil a little bit more. Uh, another use of the anointing of oil is also to mark someone. Hmm. Like, say, the anointing of uh, King Saul or the anointing of King David. Right. And uh, someone would be anointed by, say, a prophet, like, like the prophet Samuel. Right. Uh, and you can look at the Samuel chapter 9, uh, at verse uh, 16, where the, the Lord is speaking. And it says, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel. Mm-hmm. that he may save my people out of the land of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people because their cry is come off to me. So sometimes that anointing isn't even for being healing at all, right. but just to say this person is anointed by God, right. and they, they use oil when they do that anointing. Sure. Uh, so that's another, another uh, option for that. And if I remember rightly, I think when the high priest anointed, they, they pour oil on his head to the point where it's dripping down his beard and everything. So... And the word anoint means, yeah, the word anoint means to mark or to smear. That's what it means, actually. Uh, so, like the seal of the Holy Spirit. We're anointed the Holy Spirit. It's a seal. It's a mark upon God. It's ownership. But, yeah, so yeah, that's a good, good point. So, anointing is, with oil is different things throughout the Bible. And, um, yeah, I, I would just say this is, I mean, I could be wrong about this, but I think in context that's what it's talking about here because... Um, I also believe that uh, the Bible also teaches that... Supernatural healing is usually only used whenever all natural means have already been exhausted or used. Because right. how else would God get glory from a healing? Right. If you could be healed just by uh, uh, taking medicine that's available, right. and then say, okay, I was healed of diabetes. Well, you probably could have been healed by diabetes just by taking the proper medicine. Right. So how right. does God get glory from that? Right. That's a good point. Yeah, I mean, the world would scoff at that if you say, well, God healed me. Now, I would say that God, of course, provided the, heal- the healing to the, whoever found it, yes. he provided so, and he provided the means for you to find it so you could be healed, but God didn't supernaturally heal that person. Right? Uh, they were healed by natural means. And uh, yeah, so supernatural healing uh, always goes back to the fact that everything else is, is uh, exhausted and nothing else to do but the crowd to God, and God does a miraculous work. That's what a miracle is. It's something that's not the norm. Uh, that can only be attributed to, to God. Not something that man has done. So we need to be careful about saying that. It's a good point. I've, I've known many people who said, well, God healed me. What do you mean by that? You mean that God miraculously healed you? Oh, no, I took some medicine and uh, I was healed. Well, yeah, God provided medicine. Every good and perfect thing comes down from God. God, God provided a doctor and gave you a good doctor, a wise doctor, and you asked for God to give the doctor wisdom, and, and you went made it through the surgery great. And God, and God, praise the Lord, allowed you to keep on living. But did God heal you? No, God didn't heal you. Yeah, good point.